Since 2000, Neil Irwin has been a journalist with the Washington Post. He's a graduate of St. Mary's College in Maryland, where he's a member of their board of trustees. He was a fellow in economic and business journalism at Columbia, from which he has an MBA. Uh, most importantly, though, he covered the Federal Reserve for the Post all during the financial crisis that, at least according to the book, really started in 2007. And frankly, we hope that crisis is over now. Uh, this book is great. Buy this book. Uh, this is really uh, the untold story of how the world works. And most people don't follow this stuff, but let me tell you, follow the money. You know, for me, of course, us politicians think we have something to do with that, too. Love us or hate us, our tax policies, our spend policies are pretty clear and understandable. And, of course, it's easy to blame us uh, for whatever is going wrong in the economy. If it suits you, you can vote us out of office. But really, if you follow the money, according to Neil Irwin's book, The Alchemist, it's the central banks of the world and their unelected leaders that make the truly important decisions. Uh, through highly complex strategies, they control how the money flows and how well economies function and, frankly, how well the voting public is doing. When was the last time you voted for a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve? Not. Uh, Neil Irwin's book is really a fascinating account of how these central banks the federal, our Federal Reserve being the big kahuna, if you ask me, established monumental monetary policies, has dealt with the international markets over the years, and probably kept us all from really major turmoil. Luckily for everyone, the world is too big to fail. On a personal note, as a person of Swedish descent, I love that the first central bank started in Sweden. And frankly, I'm tempted to put in a bill requiring that all books about history have a timeline, just like yours. It's really terrific. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Irwin. Uh, thank you so much, Nancy. And I'm so excited to be here at the Gaithersburg Book, the Gaithersburg book Festival, which is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, and uh, thanks so much for, for your interest in the book. Um, uh, so this is $20. Uh, you can use this to, to buy a couple of tickets to a movie. You can buy a hot meal. Uh, you can take it over there and, and buy a book if you like. Uh, but why? You know, it's just a piece of paper. Uh, doesn't have much going for it. Well, it, it has the Treasury Secretary's signature here, but the, but the really important part is here on the top, where it says Federal Reserve Note. Uh, what makes this money? What makes this something that you can use to, to buy the things you want and need is that uh, the Federal Reserve and they're building down uh, on Constitution Avenue in Washington. Eight times a year, a group of economists and bank regulators, they sit around and decide how much money they're going to pump into or suck out of the US economy. They're the one who make it legal tender, who make it uh, something you can use to buy the things you need. Um, now, there's a simpler way to put that, which I, I do in the book. And it's a bit of an oversimplification, but not all that much. Uh, that piece of paper I was just holding up has, is worth $20 and can buy a couple of tickets to a movie or a hot meal or a book, uh, because Ben Bernanke says it will. Um, you know, what, what we often think of is, uh, as the, the, the power in society and what drives economies. Uh, obviously, it's the labors of millions of people around the country, but the, uh, the financial system, the, the system of money, is what creates the bedrock that allows all that to happen, the, the platform on which it stands. Now, that raises an interesting question. How did that come to be? Why is Ben Bernanke uh, and that, those words, Federal Reserve Note, why does that matter and why is that what makes that money uh, valuable? And for that, uh, as Nancy alluded to, we, we have to do a little bit of history. So I'll give you a, a very brief uh, history of what central banks are, how they came to exert this great power over the world, this great power over society. Um, so as Nancy mentioned, 1650s Sweden. We have to go way back. Now, Sweden was an was a emerging power at the time. Uh, it, it controlled a great empire. Now, if you, call, if you consider uh, controlling most of Scandinavia and a little bit of the Ukraine, great. Uh, they, they were a great empire. Uh, but they were on the rise. Now. Uh, as in most of Europe at the time, their money was, was based on metal. Metal was the way you bought goods and services. Uh, now, in most of Europe, that was gold or silver. In, uh, in Sweden, uh, they had more copper. So they used copper as their money. And they had these giant copper plates. They're about this big, weighed about 40 pounds. They were hell on the bank teller's backs. Uh, 
Now, you can see the problem there. Uh, having big copper plates is not a terribly efficient way to, to conduct commerce. If you want to go to the store, it does not, uh, it does not come in very handy. They needed a system of, of uh, having money out in, in their economy that could be more uh, efficient. Uh, and that's where the first central banker comes in. Uh, and, and here, I'll give you a little preview. The first central banker was a pretty shady guy when you get down to it. Um, his, he was born named Hans Wittmacher in Latvia. Uh, he moved to uh, Amsterdam where he learned the banking business as a young man. Spent some time in a debtor's prison. Um, and then he got out of prison and reinvented himself. He moved to Sweden. He changed his name to Johan Palmstruck. Uh, now, we don't quite know what, this, what the Swedish king knew about all that at the time because uh, doing background checks was really hard in the 1650s. But, uh, but Johan Palmstruck established himself in Swedish society. And uh, we don't even know really what he looked like or what his personality was. But I, I can only guess that he was uh, somebody who instilled confidence, that he seemed like a, a, a completely uh, credible, sober-minded, uh, serious person that the, the elite of this, uh, of this country in the 1600s thought, yeah, we're going to trust that guy with our money supply. So Johann Palmstruck got a, got a license from the crown, from the, from the royalty, to, to start what became Stockholm's Banco. It was the first central bank. And uh, it started out simple. People would take their plates, deposit in the bank. They would get, uh, they would get notes, uh, paper notes. And uh, what they realized pretty quickly is, well, wait a minute. Why, uh, why should we only give out notes equal to the amount of money, the amount of copper we have in, in these vaults? Um, why, don't we, uh, why don't we actually make loans with this, actually do something with these reserves? Because not everybody needs their big copper plates at the same time. So what these notes became was the first paper money in Europe. And, uh, and it created a boom. Suddenly, you could go to the bank and you could uh, use your, your estate as collateral or your inventories if you were a business as collateral and get these paper notes that were unconnected from the, from the amount of copper in the, in the bank. Um, the economy boomed. Things seemed to be going well. Uh, until suddenly there was a devaluation in the, in, the, in the dollar, the big copper plates, and everybody at once said, you know, I think I want my copper plate after all. And they showed up at the bank. Um, so you've seen It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, I like to imagine that Johann Palmstruck was kind of like uh, George Bailey. Oh, no, I, you don't understand. I don't have your money. It's tied up in Ms. Chris, uh, Ms. Christensen's uh, estate. It's tied up in uh, Mr. Nielsen's uh, Swedish uh, pickled herring inventory. I don't have your money. Um, now, you can see why people were not very happy with this. What happened was ultimately a collapse of the bank uh, and, uh, and a collapse in the Swedish economy. It did not end very well for Johann Palmstruck. Uh, he was brought before court, sentenced to death. His sentence was commuted, uh, but he died a couple of years later anyway. Uh, it was not the most uh, prideful, most, uh, uh, it was not a history for, to start central banking that I think many people would, uh, would look to as a, as a sweeping success. But they did invent something very important in Sweden in the 1650s, which is the idea that uh, money can be paper. And money is not so much a physical object that's in a vault, it's an idea. It's a way of keeping track in the economy and, and uh, and that's why I call this book The Alchemist. Around that same time, you had, uh, you had these uh, uh, people in, in across Europe and in, in the Arab world as well uh, who were trying through all kinds of methods to try and turn base metals, to try and turn tin or ordinary materials into gold and silver. They, you know, some were great scientists. Sir Isaac Newton, it's been said, was not the first modern scientist. He was the last of the alchemists. Some were hucksters and frauds and, and people who, uh, who didn't have much, uh, much going for them. But the truth is, um, what, what the experience of Johann Palmstruck and Stockholm's Banco proved in the 1660s is that you don't need potions and magic and uh, all kinds of elaborate chemistry to try and create gold and, and money where there was none. Uh, what you need is a central bank with a printing press and the authority of the state to, to create value, to create money. And, uh, and that became a model that uh, one by one the, the countries of the advanced world started developing and started, uh, started putting in place. So, that was the first uh, not terribly prideful, uh, not terribly uh, exciting story of, of where Central Banks came from. Um, it's been a long learning process since then, over the last 300 years, and not always, uh, not always successful. Uh, so one, uh, one moment that a lot of the modern central bankers look back to is the 1860s. 1866, the Bank of England. Once again, Britain, the great empire. Um, you know, we, we think of, of all the reasons the British, the British Empire controlled much of the globe. One overlooked one is the power of the British financial system in the 19th century. What the British banking system was able to do was funnel the savings of millions and millions of, of uh, farmers, uh, merchants, all across England, all across Britain, uh, through the city of London, through the financial sector right in the center of London, uh, into major investments that fueled the, the Industrial Revolution. 
Uh, one person can't really easily come by the money to, to build a, a massive textile factory or uh, underwrite a shipping voyage to India or Hong Kong. But, uh, but banks, by taking the savings of everyone and funneling it towards these long-lasting investments, were able to do that. Now, the